Hi all. Last time I showed my simple VGA output for 6502 computers, I was doubling the horizontal resolution from 160 pixels to 320 pixels. And this time what I want to do is make similar improvements to the vertical resolution. Just to show you what the results are going to be, here it is at 320 by 200, here at 320 by 400, and finally here is an image shown at 320 by 480. So that's what we're going to go through in this video, how to achieve that. Let's start by going back to the diagrams that I showed last time and explaining how the vertical resolution increase works. And then we'll look at a circuit diagram and see the actual changes that need to be made. Currently we're outputting each line of pixels four times. And what this means is that when the horizontal sync pulse happens and when we hit the horizontal reset signal, the horizontal counter gets zeroed again and starts from the beginning. Um, the vertical counter is also increased, but I'm ignoring the bottom two bits of the vertical counter when I'm forming the memory address, so this second row down scans exactly the same video memory that the first row scanned. Um, and the third row similarly, and the fourth row the same, and it's not until the fifth row that we actually start scanning a different line of memory. And that results in all four of the first lines of the VGA screen having exactly the same data. Uh, so I already have the signals I need to double up that resolution. All I need to do is only ignore the bottom bit and then allow everything from bit 1 upwards to form the memory address. The downside of that, going back to this diagram, is that the vertical counts here will no longer go to 128, but they will go to 256, which means we're going to need 8 bits of vertical count and we already have 8 bits of horizontal count, so that makes 16 bits in total, or 64k. Um, so yeah, this is going to require 64k of RAM. Uh, it can't be done with just 32. But in addition, the 6502 CPU only has a 64k address space, uh, and so it can't actually access directly a very large amount of video RAM, and so we're going to need to implement a banking scheme to support that. So what we'll do is we'll look at the circuit diagram with the changes I made last time, and then I'll explain what needs to be done in order to uh, allow for these uh, vertical resolution doublings. So here's the original circuit diagram for the 160 by 100 resolution. Next I'm going to show you the circuit diagram for the doubled up horizontal resolution to 320, um, and these are the bits of the circuit diagram that are going to change. It's really just the output stage. Because I'm not changing the rate at which the video circuit scans through video memory, I'm still reading one byte of video memory for every uh, four VGA pixels. I'm just rendering them as two separate pixels internally. The only thing that needs to change here is actually the output circuit to support that. So here you can see it with the changes to the output circuit. Uh, there's a new IC in here, which is a multiplexer, and the resistor network has also changed a bit on the far side here. So that was a fairly minimal change, and the changes to increase the vertical resolution are also going to be minimal in their own way. That This side of the circuit is now not going to be affected at all by this, uh, but we are going to have to make some changes elsewhere, so let's have a look at those. First up, previously I was only counting uh, 128 rows vertically, uh, so I'm using 7 bits of these two counters here to count the vertical coordinate on the screen. And to double that resolution I'm going to need to add an additional vertical address line here. And I'm going to want to pick this one at the top, not the not the higher ones at the bottom there. The reason for that is I'm currently ignoring these bottom two bits of the vertical counter and that's why we're getting double scanning and qu in fact quadruple scanning. By adding one more of these back into the mix and shifting everything up it will mean that the vertical address counts up twice as frequently. So let's add that into the circuit diagram now. And now we need to look at the actual RAM chip itself. This is a 32K chip, it's in the 28 pin package, which is very standard, and it has 15 address lines. Now we're using 8 of those for the horizontal coordinate, and we were already using 7 of them for the vertical coordinate, so we were actually using all of them and the chip was fully utilised. But now we have an extra one to add in and nothing to connect that to, so at the, at the end of the day we're just going to need more RAM here. Originally I pulled a trick here where I uh, piggybacked one RAM chip on top of another, soldered all their pins together except the chip select pin, um, and used that to get a 64k RAM. And that worked pretty well, uh, but I'm not going to go into too much detail about it here, because actually it works if you only want to double the amount of RAM, but I wanted more than that. So what I'm going to do is swap the 32k RAM chip out for a 512k RAM chip uh, that I happen to have bought a while ago. Uh, these are still readily available. 
Alliance also do 128k RAM chips, which are in the same form factor but with uh, less active pins, I think. So there's a lot of options around out there. 512k is more than enough to store one byte per pixel in VGA resolution. Um, however, these RAM chips aren't fast enough to actually deliver that to the display. Um, but yeah, the, the memory's there at the very least. Anyway, swapping that in, like so, gives us um, a 32-pin package now. So the pinout is slightly different. Most of the pins are actually in the same places, though. Um, there's just a, a bunch of new address lines uh, towards the left end of the chip. So let's wire some of those up, and um, the rest will just wire to ground, because we're not using them at the moment. And now the circuit's in a position where it is going to be able to count over twice as much memory as it's scanning the screen. It's going to count through the vertical lines twice as quickly as it did before. There's one more step we need to take here, though, uh, and that's to ensure that the CPU can actually access all of this memory. Because right now the CPU is only providing 15 bits of address space when it's writing to video RAM. And that all happens through these transceivers at the bottom of the circuit diagram. You can see this one on the right manages the low address bits and the one on the left manages the high address bits and I'm just mapping 15 of the CPU's address bits through. So we have a spare bit on this transceiver right now that's not currently connected to the video address bus so we can connect that up and so we'll have that connected to video address bus line 15. But the question is what are we going to feed in from the CPU side? I already had it drawn on the diagram using A15, but that's not really very useful. Um, A15 is always going to be set, it's always going to be high when the CPU is accessing the video memory because I've overlaid the video memory on ROM um, from 8000 upwards in the memory map. So there's no useful data there, there's no way we can actually control that. So let's disconnect that from the CPU's address line 15 and connect it to something else. And I'm just going to call this bank 0 for now. That's intended to represent a bit zero of some bank register. Now normally what you'd do in a system like this to implement a bank register is to put in something like a 74273 or a 74374 or something like that. Any 8-bit D flip-flop like register which can uh, load a state on demand and continuously output it. We don't need any control over the output enable status of that chip because it's always going to be feeding into this bus transceiver. Um, in the same way that we don't really control the CPU's output enable here. We are, we're using these transceivers so that we don't have to mess around with the bus enable lines on the CPU and things like that. So because of that, it doesn't really matter which variant of these D flip-flops we take. We can take any of them. In fact, if you wanted to use a latch instead of a D flip-flop here, that might actually work better because of the way the uh, CPU's bus timing works. Anyway, I'm not actually going to use a D flip-flop here because I'm going to cheat a bit and use the 6522 that's already present in the Benita system. There are two halves to the 6522's outputs here, there's port A and port B. And in Ben's configuration, uh, port B is connected to the LCD, and port A uh, mostly has some control lines on it which are used to control whether the LCD should be paying attention to port B at the moment, and whether it should be reading or writing, and things like that. And I've done some other videos on how you can multiplex other devices into this mix, and allow them to share port B, and use other lines on port A to control which of those devices are active, so you might want to check those out. What I'm going to do here is very similar to that. I'm not actually going to have any enable lines on port A. Um, I'm just going to make this bank come straight from port B. So the mechanism here is going to be that I assume that nothing is actually using the 6522 at the time. So we're not going to be halfway through an LCD output or something like that. So port A should be in a neutral state, which means the LCD is disabled. And then I'm going to use port B directly to drive this bank register. This video circuit's not going to care at all what's going on with this bank register except during a video memory write. Um, so it's not going to get confused when we do do traffic to the LCD. And similarly, the LCD will be disabled while we're doing these writes, so that's also not going to get confused uh, by the data going into the bank register. So this is incredibly simple to do. All I have to do is wire this straight through to the transceiver. So I'm going to use the low bit of port B on the 6522 here. And then in the code, just before I do any video memory write, I just have to set a value to port B. And once I've set that value, I can actually perform multiple video memory accesses as long as they're within the same bank. So it's quite a neat system. Um, it's very lightweight and it really leans heavily on stuff that's already in the system without having to add any new ICs. So with that change in place I can now run the test program that I wrote before 
and I've modified it slightly so that it knows that the resolution is now 320 by 200 rather than 320 by 100. And you can see the same uh, blue and orange test patterns I showed before, just a bit sort of more squashed up towards the top of the screen. Um, the lines and things like that, the diagonal lines, and I've extended this white one to go all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And you can see it's producing a really nice quality image there. We've got the proper pixel separation. None of the horizontal timings changed at all here, so we shouldn't expect any issues with that. It's exactly the same as it was in the 320 by 100 circuit. It's just we've got twice as many lines now. And you can see the uh, Gouldian Finch, and again, I still haven't re-encoded that properly. Uh, so this is still kind of all dithery and weird because it's not using the right colour depth. But you can see the size of the pixels there is nice and square again, and uh, yeah, it's, it's all working as it should. Next up, let's talk a little bit about uh, increasing the resolution even more. So this is 320 by 200. It's using about 64k of memory here, uh, at eight address lines. So to double that up again to 320 by 400, all we need to do is exactly the same thing again. We need to pull one more bit off that counter, map it through to the RAM, and the RAM has plenty of spare address pins now, because it's a nice big RAM chip. And then we need to uh, make sure that we can take another bit from the bank register, and again, the bank register has plenty of spare bits there. And the only thing missing is that we don't have any spare transceiver pins now. And the transceivers are really important because the video circuit is driving the video address bus for half of the CPU's bus cycle. It's very important that we don't drive those from the CPU side except during the other half of the cycle, um, and preferably only when it's actually doing a write. So the solution here is really simple, we just need to add another transceiver. And I got these 4-bit transceivers that come in a slightly smaller package just because of lack of breadboard space. Um, and I think four, bit, 4 extra bits is plenty for me. Um, I'll put the number on the screen, I can't remember exactly what the uh, what the chip number is for these. So what I've done is I've fitted one of those into the circuit and then I've just mapped through a few additional lines from the 6522 to the 4 bits on this transceiver. Um, and then I now have the ability to connect them to the video address bus as I see fit. And activating one more of these lines allows me to achieve 320 by 400 like I showed at this, as I showed at the start of the video. And here's an example of that running the test program now. And then also I can go up to 320 by 480. Now the trick with 320 by 480 um, is although the, although 480 isn't bigger than a power of 2 compared to 400, uh, the actual padded resolution including the blanking periods is uh, 525 in 640 by 480 which has now crossed over a power of 2 so that means we do need an additional address line to make this increase as well. And that additional address line is going to actually be at the top end of the uh, vertical counter rather than the bottom end now. We've run out of bits at the bottom end. All the horizontal timings are the same in 640x480 as they are in 640x400, so no need to make any changes there. And with that mapped through to the bank register and the code updated to program the correct timings for a 640x480 mode, we now have a nicely working 320x480 display. So we're really getting there. We're not quite at 640 by 480 yet. Uh, the next trick is going to be to double the horizontal resolution again, which is going to be a little bit more challenging than what I've done here today. It should be pretty easy to do it in monochrome. Um, it'll be more challenging with color, and I'll explain that a lot more in the next video when I go through this. As always, I hope you like this. Do let me know in the comments what you think, and give it a thumbs up and so on, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.